Coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 71, a special double episode featuring an interview with Shankar Membat, CEO at Exaget, and an interview with Jesse Jansen, social entrepreneur that is the driving force behind the Voice of Mazai Kickstarter campaign. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years. Play MPE can be accessed on Windows and Mac computers, iOS, Android and BlackBerry mobile devices. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT One to One show, the weekly show where we talk about uh, interesting uh, new startups and digital music projects. And this week it's a real pleasure to welcome the CEO and co-founder of the company Exeget, uh, uh, Shankar Mimbat. So hi Shankar and thanks for joining me, how's it going? That's absolutely fine, um, and Jetna, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's great to have you. And so, uh, first of all, uh, I don't believe uh, probably a lot of my audience will be familiar with uh, Exaget uh, yet. So, uh, can you give me a little bit, a bit of a lowdown on what the company does? Sure. I think Exaget uh, essentially delivers personalized audio content, especially advertisements, to in-stream radio. Right. We. Um, just a bit of history there. I, I used to be living in Finland. I used to work for Nokia prior to this and uh, was listening to anything other than Finnish radio <laughs> in Finland. Uh, nothing wrong with Finnish radio, just as wrong with me. <laughs> but uh, essentially, uh, the the um, I could I could get advertisements, traffic, weather information from uh, uh, the countries of the radio stations which I was listening to from, and I realized that. For the broadcasters, that was costing me money, yeah. uh, costing them money while they couldn't monetize me. And at the same time, I was responsible for marketing, uh, having a marketing budget. So finding that in-app advertising was very effective. And that made me think about combining these two, the power of radio advertising, which is very powerful because of its emotional nature. and the fact that more people are listening to it on their mobiles and hence it is essentially an in-app advertising. Yeah. And that's what it started off and that's what we do today. We uh, interrupt uh, radio streams that are being listened to online or on, uh, on uh, mobiles and we replace broadcast ads with relevant ads to the user. Awesome. And so how, how, what's the history of the company? When did it start? And of course, it's a fairly uh, tech heavy uh, project uh, as far as getting this right. So how, how did you uh, go about uh, creating it? You're right. Absolutely. So the company was set up in 2012. Um, as I said, I was living in Finland uh, when this idea started off. I talked to a couple of uh, my other colleagues, ex Nokia colleagues, and uh, that one is an Italian and the other was a finish so we were uh, we all had the common ideas and uh, felt that this was a business worth going into so i talked to uh, the media agencies that i was working with at that time talked to a few people in the radio industry and realized that yes that is an opportunity that's out there to be tapped and the three of us essentially set up the company in 2012. Awesome. And uh, did you did you have any uh, sort of qualms when you decided where you were going to base yourself uh, and decided upon London? Or was there a, a reason for that? Uh, yeah. So so while the company is actually set up in the company's headquartered in Finland because that was where it was registered, and the other two uh, co-founders of mine live in live in Finland. Uh, I myself moved to London since then mainly because uh, we saw UK as the first market to enter into. Sure. And uh, so my my I, I have the CTO and uh, the designer who are my co-founders and myself more focusing on the sales and business development. So it made much more sense for me to be in, in London. Exactly. And so, so let's, uh, let's sort of look at uh, a potential case study of, of, of radio that would work uh, with uh, Exeget. Exeget. Uh, so essentially, uh, what, what you're saying is that you would have a normal radio stream uh, online, but the yep. adverts that are, uh, you know, of course, inserted by the radio as part of the normal stream will be replaced by the adverts that you insert uh, that are localized to the user. Is that correct? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And it's not just about the fact that it would be a local advertisement. It's personalized to any user information we have, such as gender and age and so on. 
and uh, also it comes with the accompanying visual where it is needed and very importantly the call to action yeah so you would have if you're walking home one evening listening to your favorite radio station on your mobile it's possible that pizza hut could drop in an ad into you that says click on the screen now to get 2 pounds off yeah for the next 1 hour and um, and and you just need to click on the screen and and we, it, it makes a call to the Pizza Hut and you place the order. Yeah, and, and that makes a lot of sense, of course. I mean, I, I, uh, I listen to US radios as well. You know, I think that happens all over the world. A, a lot of radios have big listenerships uh, outside of their home territories. And they, of course, the advertising they have on there doesn't really help those people uh, right. or help the advertisers in any way. So, uh, you know, how, how have you found the reception from, from the radio players that you've spoken to so far? I think it's been absolutely great. Um, I think everyone, so remember this is not just about out of country, even though that's where the odd idea started off from, but it, it even even within London, um, radio station that covers, it covers pretty much the whole of London. Yeah. What we can do is have a different advertisement in Oxford Circus and another different one in Tottenham Court, if that's what the uh, makes sense to the advertiser and to the listener. Yeah. So uh, it it is a it's a vastly great uh, greater level of personalization. The other thing that that we add on being digital is the ability to track and measure. Sure. So we know exactly who has heard, uh, when they have heard it, and whether they have acted on it. All of these are things that are known and accepted for in digital marketing. We have just brought it into radio. So advertisers, I mean, radio stations are totally thrilled. This is an opportunity for them to actually tap into new advertiser base, new budgets that they haven't been able to. That's great. And uh, let's talk about the inventory, because uh, I guess that's that's a key part of the proposition, because if you're offering localized advertising, you want to try and, you know, make the most of that. So uh, are you are you creating all the contacts yourself or uh, have you have you got partnerships with agencies that have or advertising, uh, you know, online advertising companies that have those uh, relationships already? Right. Uh, you hit you hit the nail on the head. Uh, this is about inventory. And, and of course, there are both both elements of it, both the demand and the supply side of the inventory. So right now our focus has very much been on the supply side yeah. because we need the broadcasters signed up. And uh, a couple of weeks back we announced our first major deal. It's not the first one, but it's the first major one yeah. with the UKRD group uh, in the UK. And UKRD group is the fifth largest radio operator with about 17 radio stations. Um, so they would be the first big contributor to the inventory in the inven in, in the UK. Yeah. And uh, once we have enough inventory, we have already been in discussions with media agencies, with uh, radio sales houses, and uh, uh, they are ganged up and ready to start selling that inventory. Yeah, that's great. And it seems like this is a growing market. I mean, we've seen, uh, uh, for example, ads with uh, signing a deal with uh, Clear Channel in the in the US uh, and iHeartRadio. Uh, and, right. and so I think localization is becoming a, a big deal in the States, but it doesn't seem like there's uh, anybody that's really, uh, really come forward in the market here in Europe. Uh, yeah, not not significantly. I think it's it's very early days in in uh, Europe. In the UK, there's been only one radio station that's been doing this, and that's been Absolute Radio. Yeah, they are they are an innovative company, and uh, they have actually uh, broken the. Um, again, a few weeks back, Global the Global Group did announce that they they would start getting into this and helping to sell the advertisements, which is an absolute thrilling news. Uh, so it starts. This is when the market is starting to take off. Yeah, it's it's very early stages. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, do you uh, can you imagine also working across the verticals of uh, not live radio, but also working on, on more interactive uh, types of applications? To since you're going to have the inventory and the audio uh, uh, adverts to go with it uh, and sort of expand your reach uh, that way. Absolutely, and I think well, the difference we have done with respect to the two other providers of in-stream audio injection is the fact that we have developed this as the simplest technology. Having come from the mobile and having entered the market late, we always had an advantage to learn. So 
what we have is a piece of an SDK. It's a small SDK code that any publisher, a radio station app developer or the radio station themselves would just put into their website or into their app. Yeah. and they get this capability. So they don't need to invest into heavy infrastructure. What that also means is that technology is equally applicable to every every other uh, service that uh, uses online and mobile. So um, if you've got a pod, someone putting together some podcasts in an app, just put our technology in there and suddenly you have uh, a targeted advertising attached to podcasts. Yeah or to uh, the Spotify's of the world. So, yes. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, what I was thinking, of, of course, is also looking at the uh, more sophisticated, uh, you know, the advancements in uh, audio analytic uh, analysis tools out there. Uh, the fact that, for example, for, for a music point of view, you know, a lot, a lot of music marketers listen to this, but uh, if you were listening to a music radio and there was a, a, a particular band, say, that uh, was about to tour in a certain town and they knew that right. and they could target the advertising so that if their song is played afterwards, they can interject an advert that advertises their tour for that particular town, which is, you know, it's very granular and it, it requires a lot of work, but if it's done right, it could be pretty, pretty powerful. Absolutely, and uh, so they could insert the the ad that that invites people to the concert, and then have a click through right to purchase a ticket on the spot. So it's both targeting and it's getting that spontaneous ability to act. Yeah. Um, that's great. And so and finally, I wanted to ask you about sort of, uh, well, first, uh, I wanted to ask you about how you found the reception of uh, uh, the company in the, in the investors market. Uh, and you've, you've already raised uh, some seed funding. And uh, have you found that investors are excited in, in this kind of product? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's been, uh, we've now been around for two years and we just closed the seed round. Uh, I think initially the investors did have the usual concerns about is the market big enough and is attraction there. But as we have now started picking up the traction from from the broadcasters, they were totally excited. I've been very happy not only to get angels, uh, investors involved, but uh, also a Finnish venture capital firm. Right. Uh, And so that's That's been absolutely great. That's fantastic. And finally, uh, what's next for the company? Sort of what are your, uh, you know, uh, proposed milestones for the next few months and what do you hope to achieve? I think the, the big one now that we got the couple of uh, contracts and broadcast uh, partners signed up, it is really the big milestone is to get it out live and right. acting in the in the market. We expect that to be happening somewhere towards the end of September. So uh, that's, that's, of course, a major uh, milestone. And we'll continue to build up the inventory uh, broadcast partners. We'll continue to build up the sales channels. And I'm already in discussions with a number of people outside UK and Finland. These are the two places where we have uh, currently ongoing projects, but uh, there have already been significant interest and so we'll continue to expand. That's fantastic. And uh, well, uh, Shankar, it was uh, such a pleasure having you on and I would uh, recommend uh, having uh, uh, people visiting uh, exajet.com. It's uh, E-X-A-G-E-T dot com or uh, tweet them on at uh, uh, exajet as well. And uh, so thanks so much. Wonderful, Andrew. Thanks, thanks very much. It was a, was a pleasure. And welcome to the DMT One to One show. And today it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Jesse Jensen, a social entrepreneur and uh, uh, currently involved uh, in the Voice of Mazai project that we're going to talk about on today's show. So hi, Jesse, and thanks for joining me from Houston. How's it going? Hello, thank you. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. It's a, a, uh, an absolute pleasure to have you. And uh, today we're going to talk about a project that you just launched on Kickstarter, which is the uh, Voice of uh, Mazai uh, album. So uh, first of all, give us a little bit of an introduction on uh, how you got involved with this project and how, uh, how it all started out. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, quickly and briefly, uh, the Voice of Mazai work has evolved from um, some of my fine artwork. Um, In 2006, I was nominated as an emerging artist for a series of artwork called My Pop, which stood for My My Print on Poverty. And um, I used art as an awareness tool to help increase uh, civic dialogue and action to some of the, you know, the complexities and the issues. Um, And through that, I was, I received a sponsorship to volunteer myself and to um, sort of further along my learning and so I chose Tanzania, and um, through that I met a women's organization that introduced me to the choir, 
and the choir and I really had a sort of a just a, a pivotal moment where we met each other, had some startup dialogue, and then gave it some thought. And then I returned back to the U.S. after volunteering over there for a month and um, pitched an idea to them through some of the contacts that I had made that we record an album and really try to create a product that um, is more or less centric around individual empowerment. So it's really trying to create an opportunity for these choir members to generate, a, you know, a supplemental little source of income for themselves. Yeah. And so through that, we produce the album and publish the album. And now the Voice of Messi album is available worldwide. That's fantastic. And, and the Kickstarter, for those that are watching the uh, video uh, version of the show, it's uh, 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 just above Jesse's name, but I'll read it out loud so people can go and check it out. I made a short short link for everybody, which is bit.ly slash voice of Masai with a double A-M-A-A-S-A-I. And uh, uh, of course, we're going to talk more about the uh, Kickstarter. But first of all, uh, tell me a little bit about how uh, sort of the choir found, because uh, of course, the, the issue of... Uh, copyright and making money from music I, I guess for uh, the choir was probably quite an, an, an alien thing it's not something that perhaps they thought about when they were having you know when, when they were creating the choir in the first place that's correct um, this was a new idea to everyone and so we were some creative minds that came together and uh, I certainly am working from a model to help them advance their creativity and so I'm working in partnership with them and um, I'm managing the album uh, myself yeah. through my studio, but also am honoring um, them as the artists. So they get they earn a royalty off of the sales once we get the sales going. I mean, this is really startup. It's grassroots. Yeah, absolutely. So, and so, so in terms of like uh, payments, you know, what, how, how does that work? Of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it goes beyond purely money. It's, it's more about, you know, creating a, an ecosystem for them where they can sustain themselves, right? Yes, correct. Um, currently, how the model that we're that we've set up is every 30 CDs that we sell goes to purchasing a cow and then um, the you know the cows are going to the choir members the needy the most needy first um, and that's the system we'll have set up we have set up right now just as a startup solution but really once the sales hit some milestone markers then we can start using a you know more or less a payment system and we'll possibly use M-Pesa or some type of payment system where we're directly funding the choir members themselves and then they can purchase their own cows if that's what they need to do. We want them to empower their own lives um, and make the decisions for their own lives. We've just set up the model of purchasing cows now because it's most practical with the amount of money we're making from the album right now. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And so um, uh, the album actually has been out for a little while, but uh, you know, with the Kickstarter, you're really stepping up things and, and making it available in, in, in a number of different formats with a number of different uh, uh, potential uh, you know, uh, perks and, 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 and things that you can receive uh, if you uh, back the project at different levels. And so how did you come up with all those different uh, uh, levels and uh, what were you thinking about when you, when you uh, conceived the entire Kickstarter, essentially? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, the the entire Kickstarter is really supposed to celebrate this the the humanity of this project and the creativity of human beings themselves. So through the through the Kickstarter campaign, really gave us a unique platform to offer all this creative incentive for supporting something that's creative. So it's really that package of creativity, um, and the incentives themselves have really been a growth and an evolution of some of the products that I've built through Little Lady Studio and then also what I'm trying to develop more and more with the Maasai and some of the entrepreneurs I'm working with in Tanzania. So it's been an evolution and yet a celebration of, you know, of real creativity. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, there is a, a big market for world music, but uh, we don't see that many projects that come out from such a sort of grassroots level from the ground up. How, how do you think this can evolve in perhaps empowering other uh, 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 people in, in different countries uh, where there aren't the resources to distribute music to uh, go about something along these lines without waiting for a world music label to come and sort of bestow upon them the, the resources to do this. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great line of questioning and thoughts because um, one of the fundamental things we've accomplished is really creating that sense of hope within these yeah. choir members. And, you know, with, with that something so fundamental, um, creating that hope really opens your eyes and ideas and provokes thoughts to just having partnerships. I mean, I'm, I'm a creative individual that met some other creative individuals, you know, and you can build from that. So you really just have to use the power of creativity to try to drive 
drive those projects or drive that product or whatever it is you're working on. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, I think um, back to your question really is forming partnerships and you know, working with building teams, teams of people that can accomplish kind of small goals that turn into larger larger accomplishments. Yeah, because I mean, just in terms of infrastructure, I, I would imagine that even just getting the choir into a studio would have been a bit of a challenge uh, where you were. How, how did that happen? Was there a studio set up as somewhere nearby that you could use? Yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. And so that after I had returned to the US, I just really started reaching out to the international contacts I had made and asking if there was a recording studio anywhere near Moshi, which Moshi was where I had met um, some of the people I'd been working with. And the choir was about an hour from Moshi. Yeah. Um, but leading to that, yes, I was able to find a, a studio, a working professional studio in Arusha, which was, it's about four hours from Ramiti from the choir's location. But it was a very awesome, really professional studio wow, that great. the guys were professional that owned it. And um, I'm helping to try to spread awareness for their business, also supporting those entrepreneurs. So it was all done in country, except for the production itself for quality control. And yeah. Yeah, sure, of course. And and sort of uh, thinking about the uh, message of the album as well, like, was there anything that the choir themselves wanted to uh, convey as far as, uh, you know, knowing that this was going to be a project that perhaps would, would uh, be uh, have an international sort of resonance uh, that they wanted to communicate through the album, through the lyrics or, or anything around that? Or is it more traditional music? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I think as a choir themselves, they were really excited as the opportunity to give themselves a voice because the yeah. Maasai are displaced people that are struggling through quite a few things, quite a few barriers actually. And so I think they really recognize the opportunity for them just to have a voice through their music and really celebrate their land and their love of their, their life and land through their music because it's such a fabric of what they believe in. Yeah. That's great. And so uh, obviously you are based in the in the US. Uh, you have a, a studio called Little, Little Lady Studio, which you set up about three years ago. And uh, so do, do you do you think that this is going to be something that you can uh, that, that you want to c carry on doing with uh, maybe finding uh, new projects in the future? Or, or how do you see this evolving? Oh, certainly. Um, with the Maasai themselves, I'd like to look out to album number two, you know, very directly with them. But um, with other also creative entrepreneurs, that's really what I try to do is advance creative pursuits and yeah. um, they do have to fall in line with my criteria some of the things that i look for but through my product and brand itself i really try to advance creative pursuits of others because i think it's quite empowering so absolutely and, and finally let's talk about the platform kickstarter uh, how do you find that in terms of you know uh, being this enabler to allow a project like this to to, to get off the ground and uh, uh, you know have you considered other platforms while you while you were looking at this pr process and uh, uh, you know, just in terms of sustainability, do you think that this is a, is, is, is a good way forward? Uh, it's all been an evolution. You know, it's a slow progressive yeah. thing. But the Kickstarter cam platform, I think it's excellent. I really think it's a good tool. It's um, really well developed. So it's an easy tool to use for creatives. And as long as you are, you know, have a portfolio that you've been building and you can put together incentives and a real you know, a real clear message of what you're trying to accomplish. I think it's an excellent tool. Um, I've used numbers of tools over the years, but this one particularly at this time of the work with the Maasai, um, it's, a, it's a great platform to use. So That's great. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, once again, I would reiterate, uh, uh, please go and check out the uh, Kickstarter campaign. It's on bit.ly slash voice of Mazai with a double A, M-A-A-S-A-I. And uh, you can uh, pledge from $5 upwards. Uh, with $15, you get a copy of the official album. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's loads of interesting tiers uh, upwards from that. Uh, you know, you, you can get a beaded bracelet for $100 uh, plus the official album. And, uh, you know, it's, there's just a lot of interesting uh, uh, perks if you are willing to spend a little bit more money and help support this project. Uh, Jesse, thanks so much for your time and this is a fantastic and, and uh, hope uh, it, it goes great but as you're already at over $2,000 uh, you know, on, on 27 days to go uh, with a 7.5 grand uh, mark, I think it, you're going to do pretty, pretty, pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, awesome, Andre. I appreciate it. So. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening to the DMT 121 show. Uh, you can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com and follow through the links to the DMT 121 if you uh, didn't manage to catch the link. Uh, if you're running or at the gym while, we're, while you listen to the show, you can uh, go on the website and find the links over there. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time. 
If you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to digitalmusictrends.com.